someone who has blood sugar issues, do you still recommend squash, cooked squash as a part of their diet, such as acorn squash, butternut squash, Hubbard squash, spaghetti squash, pumpkin, squ pumpkin sweet potatoes? Is this something that we should be trying to include for healthy people and for people with blood sugar issues? Should we be including or avoiding that? I include it. I think that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the squashes are wonderfully nutritious, high fiber foods, help to fill people up. And of course, again, because they're a little bit higher in carbohydrate, I would just moderate the quantity somewhat. I think those foods are really um, good choices as are our carbohydrate sources. But again, it depends on caloric requirements and how much weight needs to be lost and so forth. Um, a lot of times, well, sure, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, sorry. So the hypoglycemia issue is a little bit more complex. Um, back in uh, 1979, I put an article in Pavel Rolo's book, Hyperglycemia, A Better Approach, and pointed out that you can have hypoglycemia from adrenal imbalance and pancreas imbalance and thyroid, pituitary and pineal, or all of them combined. So really, if we're going to be trying to treat it, we have to address all those potentialities in the endocrine chain. So that's the first thing. GS diet really doesn't make a lot of, it's palliative. Now, the, so that, that's kind of the most important thing as far as I'm concerned, if we're going to even, even pretend to address the hypoglycemia issue. Um, the issue of the squash and those kind of things are, uh, from my point of view, they're, they're complex carbohydrates, so they're going to go in more slowly to the system and not create that much of an imbalance. It's the, you know, the really simple carbohydrates that are going to cause the most amount of imbalance and stress the organs trying to compensate with it. So I'm supporting there what Brenda said, but we have to see it as a bigger picture. Uh, and I think that's really key in, the, in, in that. Right, we can score these carbohydrates on a hierarchical scale of quality and help the diabetic make better choices. And the hierarchical scale I we're talking about here and all agreeing on is that refined grains are at the bottom, and then you go up and we check the fiber content, the glycemic index, the amount of resistant starch, mm -hmm. the amount of slowly digestible starches, the micronutrient content, the fiber content, we consider that. We devise in the right diet for a diabetic, and we uh, modulate the amount of those foods accordingly to get the results we want. So we might limit more white potato, limit more sweet potato, give more squashes, which are better glycemic profiles, and then give more beans, which have the best glycemic profile, and better than maybe some of the intact grains even. So we moderate that to get the results we're looking for, and we can utilize even spaghetti squash, which is a better glycemic profile than sweet potato would be. So we can... We help people make better choices to get the re to get to optimize their results to get well. So I take your comments about sugar very seriously. I'm very adamant about not having sugar, but freely when I have a salad, I don't think twice about putting five tablespoons of olive oil or hemp oil or flax oil. It's a, a regular part of my diet. I you know I don't eat animal products. I take the sugar part serious. I never add salt. I would never have soda or refined anything, but to me, well, you know, I don't need, I don't, for whatever reason, my brain thinks that when I'm having a big salad, that putting five tablespoons of olive oil or flax or hemp is appropriate. What are your thoughts about organic, extra virgin, cold pressed, flax, hemp, and olive oil? I think we already answered a lot about that in the sense that we've talked a lot about people consuming excess calories as a source of a disease causation, and all oil is 120 calories per tablespoon. And, and we also discussed up here how uh, walnut oil is not this biological same thing as eating a walnut, sesame oil is not the same thing as eating a sesame seed, and that the whole nuts and seeds in their natural un uncooked states are, much, are safer forms of fat, 
and are a whole food that digests differently. They're slowly, the, cal the calories are slowly digested, not flooded into the bloodstream rapidly. The calories are not all biologically accessible. They're rich in fibers, sterols, and stanol that bind fat. They have different biological effects. So we're all pretty much in agreement that when we're looking for a source of fat, we're trying to pick whole foods, not processed foods like oil. And if you're putting a couple of two or three tablespoons of oil on your salad, you just added 500 calories to your salad. How do you expect to be thin with all those extra calories? You know, where... You can't do both. You can do nuts and seeds and the oil. How many calories are you going to consume at one meal? You know, so you've got to make a choice. We're trying to motivate people to make better food choices and to, and to pick that some foods are better than others and to try to construct their diet in a way that's most favorable and give them these guidelines. And I think we're pretty much, it's really nice to see that we're kind of in agreement and encouraging people to make better food choices here and that oil is not a favorable food choice. And... and And I would just add that uh, the way that I view it is, is that oil is to nuts and seeds and avocados as um, white flour and white sugar are to high carbohydrate foods. It's, it's the processed food of the fat world. Right. And so, so we've removed, you know, we, one thing we don't want to remove is fiber, phytochemicals, antioxidants. Now, I believe that some good quality fresh pressed oils are uh, more favorable, they have more redeeming value than sugar <laughs> because yes. you've got, you enhance the absorption of some uh, phytochemicals and vitamins, you, you've got some vitamin E there and so forth. But you, I believe you're always better off with the whole food because of the fiber and all of those other things. So what I do for my salad dressings, and I'm, I'm sure you do the same, is I use uh, hemp seeds, or I use tahini, or I use some whole nut or seed or avocado to make the dressing. So it's a whole food-based dressing, and it's delicious, and uh, you, you still get some healthy fats, but along with it, you get fiber and antioxidants. And so forth. Right. And that's why I'm always saying that the salad dressing recipes are the most critical recipe because we're making the salad dressings with healthy ingredients. We're not just pouring oil. We're blending nuts with some vinegar and some maybe some tomato sauce or other types of things that are healthy and so the dressing itself is healthy. And we, so, we're, you know, so we're not using commercial dressings with sugar, salt, and oil in them. But the dressings still taste great. And, and the other thing to mention is quite often when people go on super low fat um, uh, plant-based diets, they end up using sugar dressings. So their, their salad dressings are essentially um, refined carbohydrates. It'll be maple syrup based or something like that. Sometimes a very sweet concentrated balsamic vinegar, which actually has a lot of sugar. And there's no redeeming value to those things when you put, I mean, balsamic vinegar does have some redeeming value because it actually helps with, uh, with nitric oxide production and so forth. So it, it has some redeeming value, but you would have probably even more redeeming value with something with a little bit of fat because then you've got some absorption of more of the, the phytochemicals and so forth that are in, present in the salad. So I'd be really cautious about especially buying these fat-free dead dressings in the grocery store that are just sugar. Uh, you want to make your dressings from some healthy ingredients. Uh, one thing, too, all these salad dressings that are commercial all have canola oil in them, which is very, very deadly. People should really avoid any canola oil, organic or not. There's a whole list of reasons. But that's a big issue. Uh, even when I fly, we make our own salad dressings, and basically we use a lot of seed sauce type things, you know, some kind of liquid, because just a straight salad dries a little hard. Um, but the seed sauces, uh, nut and seed kind of combinations with a few things, uh, make a re they really make good salad dressings. Can I ask the panelists a question? Because, um there's some reports that certain types of flaxseed, because we know how beneficial flaxseeds are, but there are certain, some brands of flaxseed brought in certain areas that may have extra cadmium in them that is not favorable. So we're going to Canada to get flaxseed grown in Canada with lower cadmium levels. Have you guys heard anything about that or a cadmium contamination of some flaxseeds or not? Uh, I haven't. Okay. Un unfortunately, looking mm. even at all organic, yeah. now, 
even though organic wood has less cadmium, it's still a bigger issue, even in organic food. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's really a hard one in, in the bigger picture. So I've been trying to look up flaxseed manu um, growers and asking for the analysis of their, so of their food yeah. and their analysis and trying to pick the brands that are lower cadmium flaxseeds, because I eat yeah. flaxseeds every day, and I'm just so, are you doing the same? Well, I don't, I have an issue with flaxseed just because they are easy to get oxidized. You keep them in the freezer. I yeah. keep them in the refrigerator, but yeah. I, I, I am cut down on the flaxseed because I can't totally control when I got it, how long it's been sitting on the shelf. I have some concerns about it because it's so easily to be oxidized. Well, that's when if you order it from a grower directly yeah. as opposed to getting it off the shelf, you're more chance of getting a fresh product too. Yes, yes. But, um, 